This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. This will happen again to our children if I don't speak up. This isn't just rumors of what's going on. I saw it with my own eyes. A former Tri-West High School employee is speaking up about alleged sexual misconduct within the Northwest Hendricks school system and what he says needs to be done to better protect students. David Pyatt spoke exclusively with Call 6 Investigates Kara Kenny and shared surveillance videos that prompted him to contact the authorities. Kara explains why this video is now coming to light. Tri-West teacher and coach Tyler Bruce is charged with child seduction and obstruction of justice in connection with an alleged inappropriate relationship with a then 16-year-old student. This is surveillance video we obtained from a Tri-West attendance secretary, David Pyatt, that he says shows Bruce and the student alone together. We are blurring the student's face because she's a minor, but her parents told us that is their daughter and they want us to show this footage. The attendance secretary says he shared this video with law enforcement enforcement before Bruce was charged. In charging documents filed against Bruce, prosecutors mentioned this video and what Pyatt saw. The district fired Pyatt Tuesday afternoon after we started promoting this story and exclusive video. The school saying Pyatt confiscated confidential student information. David Pyatt has worked in law enforcement for 17 years and up until Tuesday was the attendant secretary at Tri-West High School. When we sat down with him, he was still working there. He previously had access to the school surveillance video system to track students coming in and out of the building. I used my phone to record them. The alleged victim was 16 years old at the time and a teacher's aide to Bruce. On May 2nd, as Bruce enters his office, the 16-year-old is leaving as the cameras are rolling. She returns and the two are now alone in Bruce's office. The lights go off. That's when David Pyatt walks past the office with his daughter. He goes, hey, what's going on? And it was just kind of a nervous, like... Uh, this looks weird. I wouldn't be caught dead in a dark office with a, a student, especially a female. That's Coach Bruce entering the office. A similar incident happened the next day. The student goes into his office. Yeah, see, there the lights go out. What did you think when you saw that? I was just... It was just dumbfounding. We don't know what happened in that room. The cameras don't show that. We do know Bruce is accused of touching the student on several occasions when they were alone together. Court documents outline one incident in May when she was in his office and Bruce slid his hand up her dress and later that night asked why she was wearing underwear and if she had not, he could have gone further. The May 3rd video appears to show the athletic director, Nate Bagley, peek his head into the room. And you'll see when he comes out, he's kind of smiling and laughing. And he goes back in, talks again. Hyatt says this is problematic because court documents show the school became aware of the allegations months prior and Begley knew Bruce was not to be alone with that female student. And the athletic director knows they've been warned that and he's sitting there talking. Pyatt says he didn't initially report what he saw because the staff already seemed to know. But two weeks later, that changed when he had a meeting with Dean of Students Stacy Bagley. She's married to athletic director Nate Bagley. Because she divulged some things in that conversation that, um, that gave me more concern. Pyatt then contacted the Department of Child Services. What did you tell DCS when you called them? I told them that I, be, I suspected that there was an inappropriate relationship between the victim and Tyler Bruce. I believed that the administration was not doing their due diligence in reporting it. Shortly after Pyatt's report, we know DCS and the Hendricks County Sheriff's Office launched investigations. DCS determinations are not public record. Prosecutors criminally charged Bruce in January with child seduction and obstruction of justice. He denies the allegations. Do you think that Tyler Bruce would have been investigated by law enforcement and by the Department of Child Services had you not made that report? No, oh, not a chance. Former Tri-West principal Adam Benner was also charged with failing to make a report about the matter. Pyatt says Benner blew him off when confronted about Bruce. He told me, Dave, we've turned over every stone so you can know and rest assured that we found no wrongdoing. And I said, it's actually the opposite. I said, 
with everything I know that he isn't, it proves you're not doing everything you're supposed to do. When the allegations came to light last summer, the school board kept Bruce on paid administrative leave. This despite then superintendent Mike Springer's recommendation to fire Bruce. Springer told us, I am grateful to Dave Pyatt for his commitment to exposing the truth surrounding this situation. Mr. Pyatt's reaction and response to what he saw and heard in May 2019 was the reaction and response that Tri-West administrators should have had, but did not have, and to my knowledge, still have not had. Springer also put Stacy and Nathan Bagley on leave back in July for how they handled the Bruce matter, but the board voted in September to let them return to their positions, despite Springer's recommendation to fire them. Springer resigned amidst conflict with the school board over the Bruce matter. The district now has an interim superintendent. Pyatt says he saved the surveillance video and shared it with law enforcement because he did not trust the district to preserve the footage. When we sat down with Pyatt, he agreed the school might terminate him for sharing the video with us. You know you could get fired for speaking out. If they fire me, they fire me. But it, our ki this will happen again to our children if I don't speak up. The public will know this isn't just rumors of what's going on. I saw it with my own eyes. In charging documents filed against Bruce in January, Hendricks County prosecutors mentioned David Pyatt and this surveillance video. The teen in this video has since left TriWest. Her family says she was treated poorly when the allegations came to light. We talked to her mom, Stacy Lewis, back in August when they filed a tort claim alleging the school district failed to protect their daughter. The parents of this community, they should be gravely concerned about what's going on right now at the school and, and the changes that haven't been made to stop another Tyler Bruce. The Federal Office for Civil Rights is currently investigating the Northwest Hendricks School Corporation for how it handles sexual harassment allegations. Pyatt says the district also needs to do a full investigation into who knew about Bruce and the now 17-year-old student and didn't report it. What's your biggest fear? That this continues and gets worse and my biggest fear, I have two daughters. In, one's in elementary and one's in primary school. And to me, if we don't change the culture, then it's just gonna, it's gonna happen again. On February 28, Nate and Stacy Bagley were placed on paid administrative leave with the school district in light of a complaint filed by the Indiana Department of Education. IDOE is seeking to suspend their teaching licenses for failing to properly report sexual misconduct allegations involving Bruce. Former Tri-West principal Adam Benner resigned last year, and the state has filed a complaint against his teaching license as well. The Bagleys and Benner have not responded to our repeated requests for comment. Back to you. Kara, thank you. And we asked the school district back in mid-February to speak with us on camera, but they instead provided a statement, quote, we have not viewed the video in question, but believe this video is part of an ongoing criminal case and or contains information subject to student privacy laws. Northwest Hendricks School Corporation has been and will continue to cooperate fully with law enforcement and the Hendricks County prosecutor to assure justice is served in a court of law and not the court of public opinion. End quote. And just hours ago, RTV6 received yet another statement from the school district saying airing the surveillance video exploits a young woman and we want to be clear, the student's family wanted us to show you the footage and we did blur her identity. Now you can read this whole statement right now on the IndyChannel.com and the RTV6 app and we also reached out to the Hendricks County prosecutor who legally cannot discuss evidence with us. And Tyler Bruce is now on unpaid suspension and the board is taking steps to fire him. He has denied the allegations and has not responded to our repeated requests for comment. If you have concerns involving your child in school and you are not getting any answers or help, let us know. Email us at workingforyou at rtv6.com. A controversial proposal for Broad Ripple Park is now moving forward. City leaders just approved a zoning change this afternoon that allows for a new family center and health clinic to be built at the park. We've been following this story for months, and as RTV6's Megan Sanctorum shows you, while city leaders support the project, some neighbors say they're worried about the impact it will have on the park. This is what Broad Ripple Park's family center looks like right now. And this is what it will eventually look like. Images from the Broad Ripple Park Master Plan website show a new facility with a gym, track, fitness area, and community space. 
but it will also have primary care health facilities. The project is part of a partnership between Indy Parks and Community Health Network. Park leaders say it's a creative way to fund the $19 million project they otherwise wouldn't be able to afford. But not everyone agrees. We need more deliberate and rational planning rather than impactful private development schemes. Several people who live in the area showed up at the Metropolitan Development Commission meeting today to share their concerns. More traffic, the safety issue, and we don't need a new family center either. Why then would today's planners see fit to support commercial use in a public park of all places? There has been a recent overdevelopment surge in Broad Ripple. Consequently, our beloved park should be a peaceful respite from overdevelopment, a place of refuge. But park leaders say this is an enhancement to the park and it will allow them to serve more people in the area. They hope to start construction in the next few months. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, RTV6. The Department of Metropolitan Development released a statement saying in part, quote, the city of Indianapolis is extremely supportive of the project. It went on to say, quote, we will continue to work with the developer to complete the project agreement, finalize design, and then begin construction of the new family center, end quote. Working for you, we are asking the Indiana State Department of Health if it's ready with the resources to protect you if coronavirus spreads into the Hoosier State. State Department of Health officials say they have a test kit that allows up to 1,000 coronavirus tests to be performed. They tell us health care providers will collect samples from a patient and send those samples to the Department of Health Lab, which runs the tests. Employees at the health department say they are confident they have the capacity to meet any demand for testing at this time. As of right now, there are no confirmed cases of the coronavirus in Indiana. And nationally, the United States House just passed an $8.3 billion measure to deal with the coronavirus outbreak in the United States. Senate leaders plan to vote on this measure tomorrow. President Donald Trump is expected to sign the bill if it hits his desk. A local school district will be closed again tomorrow due to the number of six students. Eastern Hancock School says all of their schools will be closed tomorrow after also being shut down today. Eastern Hancock superintendent says state guidelines call for schools to be closed when the absentee rate hits 20%. He wants to stress that this is not an outbreak of coronavirus. He says students have the common flu, strep throat, bronchitis, bronchitis and other ailments. A decision on whether to resume classes will be Friday will be made tomorrow afternoon. Students are using their Chromebooks for e-learning days at home. The work of cleaning up in Tennessee is just the beginning after a deadly tornado struck the Nashville area. And we know central Indiana isn't immune to a similar disaster. We went to the city of Indianapolis to see how first responders plan to keep you safe this severe weather season. We could see the game of the year for boys basketball tonight. The opening act is a good one as well. I'm Brad Brown at Lawrence Central High School. The state's best sectional kicks into high gear. We'll take a look and get you set for number two versus number three. Coming up in sports. And we'll talk about a temperature change that will come our way. By the time we get to Friday, it will be a brief cool down. More on that coming up. Prices at Ross. Yes, for less. This is RTV6 News at 6, working for you. Tennessee's governor declares a state of emergency after tornadoes killed at least 24 people in the Nashville area. And 22 people are still missing. Today, our Scripps station in Nashville confirmed at least six tornadoes touched down in Middle Tennessee and the Nashville area early Tuesday morning. Again, those tornadoes are responsible for the deaths of 24 people and massive damage in downtown Nashville and surrounding communities. So tonight, we're finding out how the city of Indianapolis works to keep you safe when severe weather impacts yeah. central Indianapolis. Indiana. Enter the Marion County Emergency Operations Center, or the EOC for short. When activated, the EOC brings together public health, safety, and service agencies to help get emergency messages and plans out to you. The EOC often goes into action when there are severe weather warnings, tornadoes, flooding, and power outages, and they coordinate how they're going to respond to emergency situations. So keeping Indianapolis safe is one is making sure we get our message out for everyone to be prepared. 
for, for our weather uh, on that. And then the other part, again, is that coordinated effort between all the entities, uh, that nobody's doing just one thing, that we're all working together for one common goal, and that is to make sure that we are helping everybody that needs to be helped, making sure that the power is getting put on, making sure that any kind of debris that needs to be cleaned out and any type of medical attention that needs to be rendered. And a reminder, if you haven't already, you should download the Storm Shield app and the RTV6 app. The Storm Shield app will send you real-time warnings and watches, plus the RTV6 app will keep you up to date about what's going to happen in your neighborhood from our team of Storm Team 6 meteorologists. And a lot more coming your way. Week of March 15th is Severe Weather Awareness Week in central Indiana. Well, has the moan on to himself, at least for now. Won't be the case as we get to uh, Sunday. Temperatures will be back around 60. I'm sure it wasn't alone for long today. Another nice day in central Indiana. You de definitely notice it if you're riding your bike into the wind, the way the wind has been the last couple of days and will continue to be. 37, that was our peak gust this afternoon in Indianapolis. Windy right through Friday and it turns to a cold wind on Friday. That will change though quickly over the weekend. We're much colder to end the work week. We're much warmer to end the weekend. Temperatures really flip-flop. I just want to show you, and this goes with the trend and the forecast beyond the seven day that above average temperatures will continue to march on as we go through the month. Look, you have to go way to the northern latitudes to find temperatures below freezing. Edmonton's at 33, Winnipeg just below the freezing mark, but anything really cold well north of that. Our temperatures will be in the low 30s for overnight lows tonight and stay in the 30s for highs on Friday. Looking to the west, mid and high level clouds streaming in. We stay dry this evening. Temperatures 49 in Fishers, 51 in Edinburgh. Pull back a little bit and you can look from north to south. Peru's at 46, almost 60 down in Louisville. A little cooler in Evansville. At the bus stop tomorrow morning. Kids will need the heaviest coat. It's dry, 32 degrees. The wind again works to warm us up quickly. We'll be up to 55 during the afternoon hours, but the colder or uh, the warmer it feels tomorrow, the colder it will feel on Friday with temperatures stuck in the 30s. Tomorrow at noon, 48, the clouds will increase in the afternoon and the chance for a shower is there. Not overwhelming. Don't change any of your plans. 55 degrees and a couple of afternoon showers, especially north and east, are possible. There's the wind speed out of the warm direction, the southwest. As you look at conditions, Thursday night into Friday could have a couple of flurries mix into the north and a couple of showers elsewhere. The wind is cold out of the northwest on Friday, temperature down to 38. As we go to the weekend, we recover quickly. 60 Sunday, we're dry through the weekend. Rain around on Monday and 57 degrees. We're starting to build the momentum in high school basketball. Here's Brad with tonight's big matchups. Kevin, we're at Lawrence Central High School tonight. The capacity here is listed as about 4,500. Chances are every one of those seats is going to be full here very soon as we are at the best sectional in the state. All six teams left in this bracket are ranked in the top 20. It's getting started here tonight with Cathedral taking on Christmas Attics. This game's tied 8-8 midway through the first quarter. These two teams played five weeks ago in the city tourney final, a game that Attics won in double overtime. We'll see how this one plays out as we go along. But the main event's coming up after this one. Lawrence North, number two. Lawrence Central, number three, their third meeting of the season. The teams come in with matching 22 and two records. The only two losses for LC came against LN. Regular season game was back on December 11th, then a month later in the finals of the Marion County Tourney. We'll see no fewer than six guys on the court tonight that will play college basketball. It's a shame that only one will make it past the sectionals, but that's how the blind draw of the Indiana Tourney goes. Here's what the bracket looks like in this sectional number 10. Tonight's winners will face one another in the first semifinal. That's on Friday night. North Central and Warren Central will play in the other game. Warren beat Tech last night. And then on Saturday, it's the sectional final. Whoever survives all this will move on to a loaded regional at Southport next Saturday. College Hoops tonight. IU hosting Minnesota. Perhaps the most important game of the season for the Hoosiers. That's going to be the case, though, with each one going forward. IU back-to-back -back losses last week. They're now 11th place in the Big Ten. And on top of that, it feels like they're back on the bubble to even make the NCAA tournament. They're going to need a win tonight to avoid falling off that bubble. We know a couple of things about tonight's game. Either IU or Minnesota will have to play on Wednesday at the Big Ten tourney next week. If Indiana loses tonight, they will be locked in to that bottom four. 
Even with a win, nothing's guaranteed for the Hoosiers. They still need to win Saturday against Wisconsin to get into that 5 through 10 group that will play next Thursday. The Big Ten Women's Tournament is already underway. IU will play on Friday afternoon. After a program record 13 conference wins, they are the number four seed and get a double bye. The 23 wins overall ties their best ever season as well. The Hoosiers closed the regular season, winning five of their last six. Here's head coach Tor Terry Morin talking Tuesday on her radio show in Bloomington. The parity in this league is unlike it's been, uh, you know, for a long time. We've had the number number two RPI in the country, right behind the pack all season. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's been a challenging uh, Big Ten season. It's been a great Big Ten season with with fine coaches and great players. IU will play either Rutgers or Wisconsin on Friday. Cool news at the Speedway today. Tony Stewart will race on the road course on the 4th of July Brickyard weekend. Smoke announcing he'll be in the Xfinity Series race. Driving a Ford Mustang. He wrapped up his NASCAR driving career after the 2016 season. Inducted to the NASCAR Hall of Fame last month. Be cool to see Smoke back at the Brickyard. Whole lot of hoops for you coming up tonight on the News at 11. Dave First will be in the studio. I'll be here with this one with LC and LN. We'll see you with another midweek edition of Hoosier Hoop Hysteria then. More of the news at 6 coming up after one more break. RTV6 hiring Hoosiers Parker. And a quick glance out your window, and you'll notice the mid to high level clouds increasing. We'll still have a dry night tonight, but temperature down to 38 at 11. Temperature tomorrow morning, 32. Colder than we're used to. Oh, yeah, and you'll yeah. feel it. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here tonight at 7. World News is next.